Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey everyone, welcome to the Team House. This is episode 139. I'm Jack Murphy, here with my co-host, David Park. Tonight on the show, we have Samantha Wan. She is a former Army CST, the Cultural Support Team, which was a uh, element that was stood up sort of ad hoc for the war, um, it, which was an, uh, an effort to integrate women into special operations teams uh, and help use their capabilities. And uh, we'll talk much more in depth uh, about that with Sam, but just to give you the the hundred thousand foot view, uh, that's who Sam is, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight about her life and her military career and post service career and transition out of the military. So, Sam, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. I appreciate being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're seeing your paintings in the background. I take it. Yes, um, this one right here um, was my more recent one, but. I completed this one uh, at the start of pa the pandemic. Okay, cool. I definitely want to talk a little bit about that too. <laughs> so Sam, uh, usually the way we start these interviews off is asking about our guests' superhero origin story. Uh, if you got bit by a radioactive spider or kind of how that came about. Can you tell us a little bit about you know where you grew up, your upbringing and, and sort of that um, path that led you into the military eventually? Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so I was born and raised in Bahrain. Um, I immigrated to the United States when I was 14, moved to California, um, to start high school. Uh, my parents are Filipino and they were about 50 years old when they adopted me when I was about a week old. Um, went to high school in California. As soon as I graduated, I joined the army. Um, I don't know if you guys were in as early as I was, but the cold calling, the recruited cold calling to your to your house that's how um they baited me to uh <laughs> get money for school and um get my citizenship since i was still an immigrant when i joined the army so uh, had you ever thought about the military prior to that did your parents like have a naval uh any service background or anything like that um i actually didn't know that my dad served 22 years in the philippine navy prior to saying like hey dad i think i'm gonna join the u.s army um, but yeah, I, he was super supportive and thought it was a great idea, of course, with his prior background. But, um, before that, I didn't know that he had served. And, but you never really considered the military until you got that, that cold call. No, no, I didn't know much about it. Um, I really just looked at it as a way to, at the time, get money for school, but, um, not to completely go dark um as soon as we start this uh, conversation but uh i was abused when i was a kid so i saw it as a way to kind of get away from that okay yeah mm -hmm. um and then so what when you decided that you would join the army like what did that look like for you did you just go down the office and did they like present you with all the different jobs that you could do or sign your life away kid yeah <laughs> Well, because I was an immigrant, I really didn't have many options. You know, I, I had the ASVAB scores, but they gave me food service and truck driver. And so I went with food service because I thought it was a skill I could use um, outside of being in the Army. And then when I joined, four years later, I got my citizenship um, in uh, Germany, actually, and then switched over to signals intelligence analyst. Okay. Sam, can I, can I ask you a little bit about uh, kind of like the, the subject of culture and culture clash? Um, because I just think it's really interesting coming from Bahrain, adopted by Filipino parents, then coming mm -hmm. to the west, west coast of the United States, um, then joining the army, which is its own subculture. And you just mentioned being stationed in Germany. Um, right. what, what was that like for you as a young woman bouncing between these different cultures? I think growing up in Bahrain, it's a lot more diverse than people may think. Um, I went to an international school. A lot of my classmates were from like Great Britain, you know, Ireland, um, Nepal, Pakistani, like a bunch of different cultures um, within the school system. So it wasn't too much of a culture shock other than the things that 
kids were into or the music that we listened to, um, the shows, that's what really was different when I moved to the States. Interesting. Yeah. I think it helped a lot, especially being in the military, like having that background. My parents like to travel a lot. So we, you know, I lived in the Philippines for maybe a couple months. We'd go to the States to like visit family every year, um, but didn't move tra uh, to live permanently until I was 14. And so the army represented for you a, uh, a way out of a bad situation at, at home, uh, also a, a pathway to citizenship. Yes. At the, oh, I didn't know that at the time um, until my recruiter said, like, hey, this is also another opportunity or option for you if you decide to join. And um, yeah, I, I thought it was a good idea at the time. So how did you like culinary? <laughs> Food service? It's, um, a fancy, it's a fancy word for slop and hash. <laughs> I, I said, I, I, pro I promised her we were at least somewhat professional. Yeah. I'm going to use big words like that. Um, you know, it's a completely different world from uh, military intelligence. I think uh, being in food service, the camaraderie is so much better um, within like the chow hall uh, because your hours are crazy. Um, you really have to like stick together um, versus when I was in military intelligence, it's just, I mean, everyone's really smart, but also very like introverted. So I'm kind of like a hybrid there. So I really liked Food service for that aspect, I, and there were culinary um, competitions that were really um, fun. Seeing that I have a creative background, uh, I got to do those. So I don't know if you've ever partake or seen them. No, at no. Uh, I I don't know if many people are aware of it, but like food service is one of the hardest jobs in the military. It really is. I say that without the schedule is crazy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it was uh, um. 12 days on, two days off. 12 days on, two days off. <laughs> Holy shit. And the hours are insane, <laughs> right? The hours it's are It's terrible. Insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's terrible. Uh, and, but you got uh, stationed over at Germany. Like, what, what units were you assigned to? Where, when, you know, what was this job? I mean, you were literally the cook? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, Mannheim, Germany, Coleman Barracks, 28th Trans Battalion. Um, I don't think it exists anymore. Um, but I was there from 2003 to 2007. Yeah. Okay. And so now we're also at the time frame where we're getting into the global war on terror. You lived through all of that and seeing the, the army begin to change. What was that something? I mean, even though you were in culinary services, food services, I mean, was that a real thing? Like we're at war now? Yeah, definitely. Um, being stationed in Germany, I mean, that's kind of like the stopping zone from people mm -hmm. who are going to get deployed, going to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and then I also worked at the Coleman confinement. So I worked at the military prison. Um, so not prisoners of war, but military uh, soldiers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And what I, why were most of the people, I mean, I don't know if you came in contact with them or if you even know, but like, why were most of the people there that were in military prison in Germany? Why were they there? Sure. Um, since I was a cook, uh, our, co-workers were or the people that helped us within the chow hall were prisoners um so most of them i said would say with drugs or domestic abuse um and then there were some crazy ones like killing and yeah. uh, child stuff and stuff yeah. like that so mm -hmm. uh, that's wild um yeah. So what, what drew you to signals intelligence? Obviously you had the language for it or, or language skills, but like what made you kind of select that? So when I, um, so I actually got out in 2007, um, a short break of six months and came back in because I didn't want to be a cook as a civilian. So I did that really quick. Um, so when I came back in, um, the options were a little bit better now that I had my citizenship. And so signals intelligence analysts, um, station in Hawaii. Uh, it really was a no brainer that time. Yeah. And what was the training yeah. like that for? Um, so Goodfellow Air Force Base for six months, you know, um, yeah, it was Marines, Air Force, Army. It was really, really, really challenging. I'm actually very surprised that I passed, but um, I, I enjoyed my time uh, there in Hawaii. That that place was amazing. Yeah. I would say Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And then when, uh, when did you, like, when did the whole idea of CST and, and, you know, when did you hear yeah. about that and what led you to that? Sure. 
Um, so the announcement for the program came out in 2010, late, I believe, to 2010 or early 2011. And it was really a very vague poster. And it was a woman with a rucksack on. And it was like, become a part of history. Um, I didn't have any experience with special operations at the time. Didn't know much about it. I mean, I just finished Intel school. Um, but my platoon sergeant or my first sergeant set, brought me into the office when he saw the poster. And was like, hey, I just came from Bragg. Like, you would be perfect for this. You definitely should try out. Submit your packet. You know, I'll um, write you up a letter of recommendation, all that good stuff. Um, and so without really knowing what it was, I was like, sure, get me out of here. Like, I'll I'll see what, what it's about. Um, and I think the less information that they put out about it made it more intriguing. Uh-huh. Right? It, I didn't psych myself out before going kind of thing. So it had sort of a mystique to it. Nobody really knew what it was. Yeah, I don't think they knew what it was yet. They knew they needed a um, this capability uh, within their teams. Um, they didn't know how to fill it. I have met some of the women that were in CST1 that it was more like voluntold than volunteer. <laughs> and there wasn't a... <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a strict or um, a curriculum yet, right? A training curriculum. So I, I'm fortunate that, you know, I waited a little bit for them to kind of figure out what they needed from us or, you know, how to train us up, you know, and, and it was still developing when I went through, but at least not the very first voluntold group that I, yeah, they really uh, put themselves out there because they didn't know what, what they uh, so, so, were so- what, do you have any idea of um, what number selection course this was for the CSTs? And, uh, you know, what year was that that you went to the course? 2011. So okay. I was in the very first uh, structured. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So tell, tell us about that hitting the ground at Bragg and going through CST selection. Um, so at SFAS, right, it's um, zero dark 30, whatever. Uh, 130 of us show up, I believe, the first day. Uh, and about... Um, I think five or six days later, you know, going through all the uh, tests. I think what one thing that's I've heard that's different from SFAS and what we went through is that they don't, the instructors, they don't talk. They don't yell at you. They don't say that you're doing bad or good. They just watch. <laughs> and so you don't know if you're messing up or if you're doing the right thing. Um, but five days later, I think 32 of us graduated. Wow. Out of how many? 130. And what were those five days like for you? Um, once upon a time, I used to be in great shape. So I think physically, I, you know, as long as I didn't have to worry about that, um, what mentally got me was the lack of um, feedback. Um, we're split into five teams or 10 teams, I believe, 10 or 10, uh, of 12 females each, right? And you have to learn how to lead and learn how to follow and not step on anyone's toes and all all this good stuff with like a bunch of type A females. It was uh, interesting. And they had you doing land nav and team events and things like that? Yes, like I think one of the oddest tests was like read a newspaper, do some kind of like log carrying, some kind of obstacle course and then you run back and then you are tested on what the article was about certain like uh facts in the article and like you're absolutely exhausted i have no idea what i just read you know things like that yeah um and i don't know if that's normal for sfas or you know any other selection but i think yeah some unique tests for sure what what were the uh other women like that were in the selection course, um, what were their kind of backgrounds? Did you guys start to get to know any of them and, and start to, um, I don't know, through through the kind of like the Joe network, we'd call it, I don't know, through roommate, um, were you beginning to divine anything about what this program was actually about? Um, during selection, didn't really have much time to talk. Um, and I think it would, we were too nervous to really like start chit chatting. Um, very basic. Um, information was exchanged, names, duty stations, branch, um, though a lot of officers that first class, a lot. Um, I think that was the first time there was an Air Force major, a Lieutenant Colonel. She, she actually made it through. 
Um, but because she was so high ranking, they um, put her as like staff instead, which is really sad. When you first uh, arrived at Bragg, did they like get you all together and brief you on this is what you're going to do? Like this, this is the job. This is what we need you to oh, do. Oh, no, no. I, I still don't think they knew what it was when we were going through selection. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was none of that. <laughs> That's fascinating. It was like first day you're going to get you, uh, a time ruck, your PT test, and then the next day they'll tell us, okay, this is the task for the day. And then that night we're going to go through these drills. Like I don't want to say that they were making it up as they went, but I don't think it was still <laughs> like a structured uh, uh, curriculum yet. It's interesting to me that it's 2011, pretty deep into the it's, war at it's this not, point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we've been at it for a minute or yeah, two, yeah. and they've they've they brought all these women together, but they're still not quite sure what they what they need them for. Like, we know we need them, we just don't know what. Yeah, Maybe the last and I ten years, that information was just not shared, right? You know, but like, you know, right at the time, right. we we're just told to do tasks and we're evaluated. And so once you were done with uh, selection, what happened next? So if you make it through selection, you go back to your unit and then uh, come back for the six week train up. Um, and that was um, language immersion, uh, tactics, la little na land nav, um, cultural uh, classes for sure, um, working with your TERP, um, a bunch of stuff like that. And now did they finally reveal behind the curtain what the hell your job is going to be? So I think not yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> not yet, because I think they were still evaluating who's going to do night ops, who's going to do day ops, right? They're still trying to gauge your personality, who they want to pair you with, what teams they think you'll fit in best with. Well, well, and well, 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 what's the difference between day and night ops? What's, what's all this? Village stability ops or night raids. Okay. All right. So... Whether you're going to be with special forces doing VSO or you're going to be with uh, Rangers or JSOC guys. Correct. Okay. All right. So were the day ops like with uh, uh, like re uh, PRTs, provincial re uh, reconstruction teams and things like that, or were they, were they still tactical operations? Special forces group, like first. Fifth, still, third. okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I guess... Like yeah, VSO was uh, village stability. Sc ops. Yeah, Scott yeah. Mann's uh, VSO concept. Um, cool. So, okay. So, what what were you feeling? What kind of uh, vibes were you getting as you're going through all this training about which side you want to go to? Um, I knew right away I wanted to do the night ops for sure. Um, that was definitely more my speed. Um, I felt like, you know, as much as we do to try and build this rapport in the village it's like during the day i mean you're there for six months and then they rotate out and you have to build these relationships all over again it, the success rate it's hard to measure the success versus you know if you're going in at night you either get your information or you don't or you get your person or you don't it's really clear yeah now uh, in addition to uh, like going in with these people were you guys also trained in Obviously not necessarily battlefield interrogation, but in interviewing because you are a source of intelligence for the raid, correct? Correct. Yes, we got a little bit of um, interview, um, train up, tactical questioning, um, how to build that rapport as fast as possible, especially for the night ops because um, there's not much time. Right. Um, and obviously, it's not the, the most calm scenario. So um, trying to build that rapport as fast as possible is really important. No, that's uh, it's interesting because we, we've talked to people in in like civil affairs before. Like, women had an ability that men didn't have because a lot of times uh, women in the villages would have a lot of information, but it was completely inaccessible. Um, yeah, some of the human interns have told yeah, us that. Yeah, it was completely inaccessible. So, and a lot of times women would they'd want to talk to somebody because right. they don't want this stuff in their family or in their neighborhood, you know, in the village mm -hmm. or whatever else. But there's, but it's not like a guy, uh, you know, a, a, some operator can pull a woman aside and talk to her right. where nobody else can see. That's just not acceptable. Yeah. Culturally it's not allowed at all. And um, it, once by 2011, 2012, we're already working side by side with Afghani forces too. So they would 
make sure that we were abiding by the cultural, you know, uh, ways of living or whatever. And so, yeah, that would not be allowed yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. So they grant your wish by the end of this, uh, this training <laughs> cycle uh, to send you to, uh, you're going to do night ops. You, um, well, at least when I went through, you get like your top three choices, right? And I think because I was already, I had a clearance, you know, I worked until mm -hmm. um, I could be assigned to JSOC or, you know, with Debra. That's pretty cool. So I, now are they starting to figure out what a CST <laughs> is going to do? I, I've got yes. to keep it. Okay. Okay. I've got to keep coming back to this theme until, <laughs> until I get a definition of what CSTs do. Well, I mean, the program's still so new and even like, you know, when we were changing hands or like doing the turnover, um, there's only so much information they could share, like, because they want to on so many missions, right? So it's like, hey, this is what I've learned. This is what works, what, what doesn't. But you kind of just have to learn as you go, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you get selected for night ops. And, and then what happens next? Then I'm, I'm assigned to deploy. We start getting ready for that in February 2012. Um, we end up in Bagram and then we split up uh, depending on, you know, where you're supposed to be. So uh, did you not go down to Damneck to do like a train up or an introduction with not with them? No, not beforehand. No. Mm -mm. Nope. The first time I met my team was in Afghanistan. Okay. So you show up and uh, here is Sam Juan <laughs> with a bunch of like burly seals. I mean, how, how does, how, uh, how does that go over culturally that this is something that like, we had never really done before, right? right? Um, I can speak from like the broader picture, maybe like what they were told or asked to, you know, play nice and like, hey, this is a program that we have to do regardless of what your personal feelings are about it. Um, and we got to see if this is going to work or not. You know, s the majority of the SEALs, they were really um, – accepting uh and uh cooperative um but some were not no, well as long as, 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 long as right. the leadership was that's all that's important right <laughs> not really i mean yes <laughs> overall yes but like on the ground um if your teammate doesn't want to work with you it kind of makes it hard to do your job yeah mm -hmm. yeah and, and so you guys hit bagram and then get split off. Where, where did you end up uh, getting sent to? Prob Shank, local province. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So now you're, you're kind of living the dream, right? I mean, there were very, and there still are very few opportunities for women in special operations. I guess there are more opportunities now, but we still don't have very many that have gone through the, the pipeline, so to speak. Um, but so, I mean, you were, I mean, really were kind of like a, a rarity in sort of a, uh, a uh, like a template or a prototype for I think what special operations is still trying to do today. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I think we were the guinea pigs, you know, to see mm -hmm. if there was any level of success, if they could measure it, if they could replicate it. Um, and now that's, you know, some doors have opened Women can go to ranger school, um, go to, you know, become infantry women um, and that kind of thing. But I mean that they're going to come with pros and cons. Like I have um, my nieces, or my nephew's wife, she's an infantry woman, and she, the amount of sexual assault and stuff like that, it's just not, we're not ready yet, I don't think. Um, you know, to live in barracks, to deploy, you know, it's just not set up yet. Like yeah. culturally we're not ready, or like the yeah. the, the institutional in infrastructure for it isn't there? I think the institutional infrastructure, it's a cultural change, it's not going to happen overnight, and then mm -hmm. You know, the women that are going through this, like, they're not thinking of that, of course. Um, it's not until they get to their unit that they're like, oh, shit. Like, they are not prepared to have, you know, women on the team like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as outside of sort of that cultural issue, I, I'm just curious because you, you showed up and you deployed – and from a unit that, you know, from an organization that wasn't really kind of conceived in full yet, how prepared were you just like logistically? Like, because if you're talking about dev group, all their gear is Gucci gear. Like if they're going to, if they're going to walk five miles or whatever, like they're walking in good boots, you know, they're, mm -hmm. you know, they, they have comfortable rucks, things like that. Yeah. 
what kind of did you did you did they give you like two thousand dollars and say hey go to REI and kit yourself out before you went? No, or did um, I did invest in some good boots because I um, we were allowed to buy our own. Uh, I think I had Loas or something like that. But once I got to Afghanistan, the team was nice enough to fit me outfit me with their gear, and so I got the Gucci. Yeah, I mean, because it, it matters, <laughs> right? I mean, the the difference between the quality it does million, make a difference. Yeah. Holy cow, it makes a huge difference. Yes, for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it, I mean, you're kind of like living the dream, though. Now, I mean, you're with a JSOC Strike Force out at some fob. Um, just like before, we get to like talk about operational stuff. I mean, what was that experience like for you out there in Afghanistan? It was honestly one of the best opportunities or experiences of my life. Uh, a huge honor, you know, um, whether or not each individual SEAL liked that. Um, for me personally, it was a, you know, uh, an accomplishment. Uh, be coming to the United States as an immigrant and now I'm with JSOC, like, it's not something that happens very often. How, how old are you at this point? Uh, 27. Yeah. So you came a pretty far away. Mm hmm. I, I for, for the not, I don't want not to throw salt but, or shade, but, but but like for the guys who weren't happy with you being there, what were what were their issues? Because you, it's not like you're in the stack, right? It's not right. like you're going to be the number one person through the door. Like, no. what were their issues? No, I you know there was a, a very regimented protocol of how, when I were was to come in. Like they would, I can't just like run amok. You right. Know, I, I'm a liability. I'm like a test subject. I'm very high vis. So like, um, one of the main guys that had an issue was, uh, you know, without even talking to me and he's like my TQ guy, like we're supposed to exchange information on target. Um, he's like, I don't care what Sam has to bring or say, I don't trust anything the women have to say. So I'm not going to take any of our Intel. And it's like, okay. Um, and he said that uh, during a debrief, like he stood up in front of the entire team and said, like, I don't give a shit what Sam has to say. Like, I'm not listening to her. So that was kind of challenging. Um, it's interesting uh, because I, I've heard something similar and I hope it's not, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it is like this today, but um, this is going way back to the 1990s actually when uh, Delta started bringing in women to serve in intelligence roles. And mm -hmm. they would, in the unit, they would call them, I think they were believers and non-believers. And so there were some guys who supported this program, thought it was like, yeah, we have women who can go and gather intelligence or break up the pattern of just having a man. So it's a man and a woman because mm -hmm. one jacked up, you know, tough looking dude by himself conducting a reconnaissance mm -hmm. in Bosnia, you know, it stands out so you can right. pair them up and it blends in a little bit better. Um, but then there were people who were non-believers and were just like, they just full stop, like you said, like that, that one particular person um, just had a sort of gut reaction or instinct yeah. about it that like i don't care what this capability is i don't care who this mm -hmm. person is <laughs> i am just dead set against this happening yeah yeah and i mean there's nothing really you can do i mean the leadership then was like you have to do this <laughs> like it's not really your choice anymore we, these are our orders you know and you need to make it work um it just made it you know i don't think it was anything personal against me i think it was just the idea and mm -hmm. so i was just like on the receiving end of that. Um, but yeah, it was not cool. <laughs> it was not a good working environment with that guy. I'm sure he has great personal relationships with women <laughs> in his life, you know, great love life. He's not projecting anything at all. Right. Shade. <laughs> Shade. <clears throat> oh, we went there. We went there. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, well, well, did going out on target, I mean, do you remember like your first operation that you went out uh, with these guys on what it was like? Yes. Um, so with JSOC, typically they only have one CST versus with Rangers or um, Thank you. Uh, during the uh, VSO missions, like you have two. So during the handoff, um, I remember the first one because I was still with another CST and she was kind of showing me the ropes. Um, but I was more like watching her see her do her thing. And then um, after that, like maybe two or three missions more and then it was just me. Yeah. And, and what was that like for you because you hadn't even you know unlike a lot of like men who who go out on these raids even if they hadn't done them before they had been training for them yeah 
you know, for quite a while generally. Um, but in a way, you're sort of just thrown into this, right? Yes, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, so what was that like? The protocol of the time. Uh, very, I mean, you don't want to lose your shit, obviously, right. <laughs> then, um, and try to keep it as cool as possible. But they usually ask the women and kids to come out first. And so I'm like rushing to the door then and trying to gather them in one pile and doing my searches as fast as possible um, by myself, right? Uh, my Turks with me, yes, but um, usually there's a bunch of women and kids um, at these compounds. So got to move quick. So what you're talking about is at this point, they had moved to call outs where they're not necessarily doing unless, you know, they're not always doing just like a SWAT style raid for people who might not know how this goes, but they're standing outside the compound, outside the walls on a speakerphone and the interpreter yeah. or whomever saying, you know, come out, come out, come, on. come, mm -hmm. out, come out. And mm -hmm. even if the guys are going to fight, a lot of times they will send their women and kids out to get them yes. out of the fight. That's exactly right. Yep. Usually they send them out first, you know, and even if they're uncooperative, they'll, like you said, they'll send them out at least. And so your job at that point is to search all the women that come out to make sure that they're not suicide bombers or, or men yes. in disguise or whatever. Exactly. As soon as they're coming out the door, the kids, the women. Um, yeah. And usually there's like 20 of them, 30 of them. There's a ton on the compound. So yeah, having to do it really quick so, try and be as accurate as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, it's, really a risk to you too, because if somebody is a hostile actor, yeah. you're the person standing right yep. there. Yep. That, yes, exactly. Yep. There's usually one, uh, one team got a guy on each side and then I'm searching. You ever have any, uh, interesting experiences finding contraband on the, on people or. Um, yes, definitely have found some interesting things. Um, American money, lots of American money. <laughs> um, yeah, Chris, $20, $100 bills, things like that. Um, don't know what that's about, how to turn that in. Um, All of it, though? No, just, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, come on, a little to the college fund wouldn't hurt. <laughs> that's what I went, you know, GI Bill, right? Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You know, it's like church. We pass the collection plate around twice. Right. <laughs> Just to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Make sure. Yeah. But. So had you, like, had you done rehearsals for that, either it, at the course or with the SEALs themselves? Um, during the course. Uh, we, did, we did it with the Ranger, or excuse me, SF, during at Bragg. Mm -hmm. Some, like, role-playing. Um we weren't kicking down the doors per se, but like uh, they try to make it as realistic as possible. Right. So at least you mm -hmm. sort of knew at that point, sort of what was expected to you during like this call out and things like that. Yes. I, I even remember finally they were giving us feedback um, as we were doing, going through the exercises. And um, one of the comments I'll never forget is like, I thought you were going to be tougher, Sam or Juan. Um, and I was like, Oh fuck, fine. <laughs> I will be more aggressive. <laughs> um, doesn't always work uh, in real life scenarios, but uh, that's what they were trying to like bring out of you. Yeah, just mm -hmm. to sort of have that that authority that so nobody mm -hmm. messes with you or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Not to like take advantage of you or like you know, oh, it's a woman. Of course, I'm gonna just right run all over her. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because it was common to like doing raids and stuff. Like the women would actively get in the way because they yes, knew that, I've seen that they knew that guys generally were not going to like force them aside or, right. or do anything very aggressive. So they would get in the way or when they were yelling at you and, you know, like tapping you, mm -hmm. you know, like, no, no, you know. Um, right. But yeah. So they wanted you to kind of put forth that, that energy, like don't fuck with Yeah, me. definitely. Yep. Um, and, but you'd have to read the room too. Right. Like you can't always do that. You know, that'll turn off. They won't be as responsive. They won't, right. you can't build that rapport if you're always like, you know, super aggressive. Right. Um, yeah, I would say one of the most successful um, interviews or uh, tactical questioning uh, situations was when we came to the compound and one of the, I think she was like 15 or 16 year old girl, she had just given birth. Okay, so she like, 
maybe a couple hours before. And so in, in immense pain, uh, and I had a daughter at the time, so I knew how to do the whole breastfeeding thing and all that. So I'm propping up the kid and being really feminine. And um, the mom wow. is like, tell her whatever she wants. Like, you know, she, they're there to help us. I got the, the medic to come and help give her pain meds. And um, yeah, it was it, that kind of situation. Like you just kind of have to read the room. like. Trying to be aggressive in that moment isn't probably going to be very right. helpful. Right, that's that's wild. Right. That's like the that's like the real CST <laughs> mission right there. Yeah, it really is. And it, I don't know how much you can tell us, but you said it was one of the most successful. It's like, what kind of information or intel came out of that that situation? Um, try. Uh, it wasn't hard to find out who the person was that we needed to find. Yeah, it was very forthcoming. Yeah. And I, I, Sam I think, was teaching like uh, breastfeeding classes there on. The yeah, you got to prop up the pillow under yeah. the thing. That's amazing. <laughs> For real. Yeah, no, it really is because I think <laughs> I think a lot of people like don't understand that a lot of times when you're when JSOC was doing these raids on mm -hmm. like signals intelligence alone or whatever, you can go in a compound where there are 15 guys, like 20 phones. Yeah, all, all set. In a, so, so you don't know which phone belongs to which guy. You know your guy is in there, but you don't know who he is because it's yep. all based on SIGINT. So you know you're able to decipher this information um, because the women are, are willing to tell you who's who. It, yes, they they were more forthcoming with information, especially if you know they could trust you. I would usually take my. This is not very safe tactically, but I would take my helmet off. Right. Um. So they could see my hair. Right. Um, in some of my deployment photos, you'll see I have like braids and that's not in regs or whatever the heck most people say. And it's like, no, this is like to accomplish the mission faster. Like, so they can see that I'm not a guy. Right. Um, they encouraged us to grow our hair out, um, stuff like that. So, right. Um, were, were they pretty shocked to, that there was a woman on this team? Yep. A lot yeah. of the times they were very surprised to see a woman on the team. Cause I'm, I mean, I'm in the same uniform, you know, it wasn't until I, and right. I had a, a scarf but I would take off my helmet and that was when they could tell the difference. That's wild. Um, mm -hmm. So are there any, any other, like from that deployment, like particular stories, any like firefights that or any other particularly hairy situations that kind of stand out for you? Yeah. One in particular, um, after that mission happened, like operations across Afghanistan stopped pause for like a week. Um, you know, come out, come out. They don't want to come out. Um, call for backup, Hellfire, crush the entire compound. Um, only survivors were these two women. Um, and of course that's my responsibility. They're hysterical, you know, just let me die here. Uh, don't bring me back. You're going to kill me. You're going to rape me, you know, all this stuff. Um, and then bringing them back to, to base, you know, tr still having to question them, uh -huh. you know, and all they can do is cry you know I, one of the mother uh, she was trapped under the rubble and she literally was like you know i watched all my kids die in front of me and i couldn't do anything um so stuff like that's kind of ch challenging and tough um and trying to like how can i console this lady how can i console her and like still do my job um with a good conscience you know yeah, kinda, it sounds yeah. like I mean now that uh, you're actually explaining what the job is, it sounds like um, much more difficult than I than I imagined beyond like tactical questioning because like on one hand, yeah, you have to be a badass with a rifle and prove yourself to all these dudes that you're working with and like be that gangster when you have to. But at the same time, like you're also having to like comfort women whose yeah. families have just been wiped out or help them, you know, deal with their infant baby. I mean. Like those are two like very very different roles, and I I don't know how you handled that as as one person balancing those two things. Um, it's like a very fluid thing that needs to happen instantly, you know. Um, that's the training that they gave us. Like they were doing the best that they can, but it's really instinctual, right? Like you can't mm -hmm. guess how you're supposed to react. You don't know how you're going to react when you need to teach someone how to breastfeed and they're searching the room right next to you and like shots are going off. <laughs> like, right. um, you know, it's a crazy balancing act. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How, how much feedback was 
you know, like the, the schoolhouse and the people in charge, how much feedback were they getting from you guys in the field? Like, okay, like this is just what I did. Like this needs to be included and incorporated in the training or this is how to evolve training. So since we all were split up and a lot of the, um, like we were the only women on each of the teams. So we would have like either weekly or biweekly calls to kind of do check-ins and like keep each other up to date on lessons learned, things that happened. Um, so it, there were regular check-ins. That's great. Was, yeah. Were uh, were the people back at Bragg, were they receptive to like, you know, to the input? Yes, for sure. And I think, um, so one of the women, women that I deployed with, she was stationed at uh, like Southern Afghanistan. I can't remember which exact uh, fall, but she took over the program um, for the next like seven or eight years. So she ran the program after that. And so she deployed like five or six times. Um, she She's amazing. And so the program definitely saw some continuity. And so they, they were able to build and like progress. Um, probably not as much as she would want, you know, you know, sure. but you know, uh, I think that was probably the smartest way they could do it, instead of having turnover of leadership or, or whatnot. So. Oh, and what about the guys you were with? I mean, did did even some of the uh, the non-believers start to come around to the idea after a while? Um, well, since the CSC program was only a year long program, most you know, other than um, the one that I said took over the program, you only volunteered for a year. Your mm -hmm. unit's not going to let you go. Just, there's not an actual CST unit. Right. Um, and so I don't know if I think it's still continued on, you know, like some people were cool with it. Some people are not. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of the, the nature of the beast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It, it's, t it's tough to imagine anybody, uh, you know, looking at the capabilities or, or, or getting like the intel or, or like you mentioned on the, on the one particular op that you were on where you were able to positively, positively identify the guy. It's yeah. hard for people not, it's hard to understand how people can see that efficacy and, right. and not become a believer, whether you believe in women in combat or not, like this is something very specific and very needed in some ways. Yeah, I mean, the skill and the, the need is there, the tool is there, and there are women that are raising their hand high in the air, like, hey, I want to do this, train me, you know? Um, but it, I think we're a long way of it becoming uh, an accepted, like, yeah, this is definitely a skill, and everybody believes in it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, so what, what were some of the more interesting things that, like, you realized or learned, like, working with these JSOC guys? Um. Definitely coming from like a regular army unit to even like Intel, but now you're, you're wearing Gucci, right? Yeah. And then you have to go back to wearing your uh, standard issue. Um, yeah. I really, there's a huge, huge difference. Um, yeah. Playing with adults versus being treated like a child, Yeah, you know? Um, and if there was a way to like continuously finish out my career with at JSOC, I would have, um, try to do that, but I realized soon after I got back from Afghanistan that I, I was done. I think you know, was, and on a high note, let's let's do that. And so um, it was really it was that that one deployment to Afghanistan, and then by the time you came back, it was sort of like getting towards the the end of that one year mm -hmm. uh, term in the CST program. Correct. Who yeah. who who are we? Did we interview a while back that was in that same boat that? It was another woman, and she felt like she also got to the same point where she had, uh, like, the organization didn't know what to do with her at a certain point, and, yeah, and she remember. retired. Um, I'm sorry, I can't yeah, I, 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 I can't remember. I mean, but it's, I just, it just comes up and resonates because I know I've, I've heard similar experiences over the years. It, it, so, in a way, seeing what what JSOC had and the way mm -hmm. they lived their life and what their military looked like. And then going yeah. back to the regular military, it kind of ruined it for you. It you had all the toys, and now you have no toys. Right. Like it's it's hard. It's a hard transition back because um, you're used to being, you know, autonomous. You're yeah. used to being treated like you know, except for the one dude uh, that didn't like CSTs for whatever. Right. Um, most of them treated you like grown up, and I really enjoyed that, and I felt like 
it should always be like that. Like, why isn't it always like that? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, how did the people in your own unit like respond? Cause you weren't even like in a combat arms unit, you were in a SIGINT unit. So you might mm -hmm. have some people, some guys there who had been on like a, maybe a SOD a maybe, but for the most part, like people in, in that career field weren't going into, into no. combat. What, what did they think of your experience? Um, yeah, you had to volunteer, like people were volunteering to get deployed and slots were limited. So deployments were really rare. Um, they were really, uh, supportive. Um, they, you know, it's super vague and people don't really know what it is yet. So they were just like, Oh my God, that's so badass. Um, but yeah, a lot of encouragement, a lot of support from my leadership. Yeah. Here. Okay. I, I remembered who I was thinking of. Uh, Sa Sam, if you'll tolerate this segue, this is relevant. This is relevant information though. Uh, we have not interviewed her on the show. I've talked to her in the past. Um, Katie McBriar, who in 1977, when the army started up a counterterrorism unit called Blue Light, um, to be an interim unit before Delta was stood up. Katie was uh, also an intelligence analyst at fifth group and the group commander brought her into blue light um, because he wanted a f woman to have an intelligence gathering capability, someone who could dress up like a nurse or a flight attendant and go in close to where the terrorists were and gather information and help them plan the operation. So Katie, uh, was brought in and they trained her and she shot uh, very well, jumped out of airplanes, did all the things the dudes did. And sure. these were hardcore Vietnam veterans, very skeptical of her initially. Right. Uh, yep. But as time went on, every single one of them that I spoke to said that Katie was value added and that she was a great member of the team and they really came to love her. Um, and, and Katie is still out there. Uh, She's a great woman. I'd love to introduce you to her sometime, Sam. Yeah, that would be amazing. That, yeah. I would love to hit, talk to her. That, yeah, that's she's, really cool. she's super cool. Yeah. But but anyway, I bring it up because she told me very, very similar that after being in blue light, mm -hmm. it was like, how do you come down from that? There, there were no yeah. roles for a woman to, to do anything even remotely like that ever again in the Army. Again, this yeah. was ni 1977. Yeah, I, you know, I can definitely attest to that from... I think 13 or 14 women that did deploy during doing the night raids um, during my cycle, seven of us got out right after. Okay. So that mm -hmm. attests uh, to that. They uh, they returned back to their regular unit and were like, nope, I don't want to do this. I want to go to school. I want to start a family. You know, whatever it was, do something else. They got out. Mm hmm. Um, I, I've noticed a couple of people in the comments have have uh, asked about Ashley White. You you said you knew her or. Well, I didn't know her, but we were in selection together. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and that just goes to show that you guys weren't just like hanging out and like, like, right? You know, yeah, yeah. So the the how long did the actual CST program itself exist? You said it wasn't long. No, it wasn't long. I think nine or ten years. Okay, so okay, so yeah. it, it did go on for a, a bit of a span, but there were just one year terms for you guys. That's really weird, a really weird way to run it because there's no institutional knowledge at that point. Yeah, I mean, the turnover, and I don't know if, if there are any CFCs other than, you know, the, the woman that ran it that were able to go again, you know, like, so you, you train up this woman, you take all this time, yeah. you invest all this money, and then you send her back to her regular unit, like, right. what a waste. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would well, you know why they didn't? They hadn't stood up a unit for that, or why they didn't? You know, seek to capitalize on the investment they'd put in you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why they didn't like stand up a unit at JSOC. Right. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they had other capabilities. Um, you know, like that 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 element in, in Delta that recruited you know small numbers of women. Right. So wh why they didn't formalize the CST program mm -hmm. earlier doesn't make sense. But now, I mean, I, I think you're, you're right, Sam. The military is clearly struggling with this. Um, I think it was around, oh, man, what year is it? Now I'm having to rack my brain. It was probably around 2015 or 2016 when I, I remember being down at Bragg talking to some special forces officers, and they talked about the CST program on its way out and how mm -hmm. they wanted to create a more formal process for women to enter special operations. And now, since then, we've seen them open the doors uh, for special forces, Navy SEALs, 
um, Rangers. Ranger school, yeah. Ranger school, a lot. Um, only a couple, I think, serving in the in the Ranger Regiment at, in infantry positions. And we've seen one woman graduate from the Special Forces Qualification Course so far. So mm -hmm. small, small numbers. I mean, I, I think uh, if I were if I were to opine on this, and, and I mean, you can feel free to call me an idiot at any time at any juncture in this interview. Um, but I, I feel like there, there's this need for a, a, a capability for, for women to be on special operations teams, but they don't necessarily have to wear a green beret or a tan beret. Right. Uh, they don't necessarily have to go through that entire pipeline. Um, we could train them just to do the sorts of things that you did, Sam, the sorts of things that some of the women who work in intelligence roles do and kind of bring them in on, on that sort of basis they don't, without ne them necessarily right. being a SEAL right. or, or a Without going through BUDS or SFS right. or whatever right. else. I, yeah. I think that's what they were trying to do with the FET teams. Are you guys familiar with that? Yeah. The engagement team? I, I worked with them in Iraq in 2009. Okay. Yeah, I think that was the idea with that for conventional units. Mm -hmm. Um I'm not familiar with their exact like what their responsibilities were, but they definitely did not have a pipeline from what I at least in the beginning. They were still trying to figure out what their role was as well. Yeah. The 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 FET was the female engagement team, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's great. And they, they worked with my ODA in, in two thousand nine. And then the, the Marines had a program too, it's at one point too. Um I can't the lionesses. remember. Mm -hmm. Say it again, please. The lionesses, I believe. Really? That's what it was called? I, I think th so. I thought there was like an acronym or something like that. Oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> okay. I thought they were the lionesses. Okay, cool. No, I didn't know that. Um, so you did your year in the CST program. What's going on for you at this point? I mean, you spoke a little bit about it. What, what What's the next step? Um, so then I, you know, got, I actually got back into art in Afghanistan. So in my off time, um, I'd paint to kind of like take my mind off what was going on. I used it as an outlet. Um, and so once I got out the following year, I, I enrolled right into um, ODU, uh, majoring in painting. And then I switched to drawing design uh, my last year. But yeah, I, I immersed myself right into to school. Okay. And mm -hmm. you, you mentioned, I think at one point that you had a daughter. Yes. Yes, it's, and so you were already in the military trying to balance having having a, a, a kid on top of all of this. Yep. So I had my I had Jasmine when I was 24. So she was, you know, with her dad at the time when I was um, on deployment. But yeah. So, yeah, you got a lot going on in life. <laughs> uh, I think that's pretty common in the military. You know, yeah. you kind of just juggle everything. Some things yeah. you do well, okay at, some you kind of do crappy at. Right. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I say that, and I mean, maybe that's just my own uh, bias coming out because obviously a lot of the male soldiers have kids at home too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. gotcha. When, sure. when uh, did your deployment with the CST, did it like affect or change your opinion on Afghanistan, on the war on terror, things like that? Um, not overall. I think, you know, when we were on mission, there wasn't much time to really gather a full picture. I think those working VSO or day ops, um, they got to see more of what it really meant to live in Afghanistan or like what those situations were, those living situations were, because they had to, to immerse themselves in it. Versus, you know, I got got to go back to the fob every night, and um, you know, I, I probably would never see that that woman or that group of children again. But and then, yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, and then, like, was there because we talk about this quite a bit on the show? Uh, we talk about this quite a bit on the show in terms of like post traumatic stress from like operators, from people who have been having been on target and seen the things that you did. It, and, have you sort of experienced any anything like that? Yeah, I I do have. I struggle with PTSD, especially uh, talking about that one um, specific mission, um, anxiety, depression, stuff like that. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. how has like the af your after service the after service support been for that? Um, I went through my own way of 
medicating and coping and dealing and I didn't want to talk to the therapist, you know, the the Ryush. Um, not until recently, not until um, at the start of pandemic, I finally was. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I need to get my shit together. Yeah. And so finally started going to therapy. Um, and the art back there is inspired. I don't know if you guys are familiar with like psychedelic therapy for veterans dealing uh-huh. with PTSD. I'm a very, very, very strong supporter of that. It has done wonders for me. That's interesting. So did you have to go outside the VA for that? Because the VA isn't supporting that yet, are they? I don't believe so. Not yet. Yeah. But um, what I've seen personally and seen other uh, veterans go, the progress that they've made, even with one treatment, it's just remarkable. Um, yeah. And so, um, yeah, uh, I'm hoping to work in that field soon. Very, very soon. That's great. I, I I think that's one of the frustrating things about the VA is because they are under all these federal mandate because, you know, it's a federal organization that all the things, you know, whether it's with cannabis or MDMA or psychedelics or whatever, mm-hmm. like the, uh, for all the veterans they see, they're not, they're not utilizing any of those. They're not open to any of those. Um, they don't support any of those. Right. Um, ketamine was going to be approved. Um, I believe under, under Trump actually, um, the nasal spray, esketamine, um, but they, uh, at the last minute, recalled and denied. Wow. But I, I've tried that as well, and it's really, really great. And I, I've definitely spoken to people who are, like, huge advocates of, uh, like, DMT and ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. And so just like you mentioned, even after, like, one treatment, um, yep. just having, like, tremendous results from that. Yep. Um, for myself, you know, peyote, 5-MeO-DMT, uh, psilocybin. Um, I've seen or and talked to people that have gone through Ibogaine and ayahuasca and, you know, battling addictions, really, really bad addictions. And after one treatment, like never did cocaine again or, you know, any um, opiates. It's really powerful. If, if you're comfortable, could you tell us a little bit about like what your experience was like and, and how it helped you? Sure. Um, I think I've gained the most progress with the psilocybin 5-MeO um, combination. Um, the psilocybin would... What we do is like a hero dose, they call it. Um, So five or six grams of mushrooms. You know, you're in a room, uh, a group setting um, on a mattress, eye mask. Um, They have a soundtrack playing like different types of music. And it's almost like reliving your life again. You're, You're able to watch your life. You're like in this movie. And let's say there's something that happened that you you haven't gotten closure over, right? You wanted to say something, then you didn't, didn't get the chance to, and you relive it and you say it and you close that chapter and you kind of just, you know, that burden has been released. And you do that for like five or six hours. It's like a hundred hours of talk therapy in like one chunk. Wow. And now is this, yeah. is this guided where, there, where somebody's talking you through your, your life in that way? Um, no, the the amount of psilocybin, the hero dose, you're you're not really talking. Okay. Yeah, um, a lot of crying, a lot of crying. Um, one of the times there was a guy. We call it the battle cry. Um, he was just yelling, and it, like this is on the on ramp of the the medicine, you know. Um, and then you hear a, <sighs> and not like a despair. Oh my God, I'm gonna die, but like. He is reliving some sort of like deployment situation, right? Like I'm going to kill you motherfuckers. And all of us in there kind of like, we're all in the the same room and it kind of jolts you out like, oh fuck, now we're in it, you know, like, and this is why we're here. And like, you have to like deal with your own shit while you're listening to somebody battling theirs. Not only is it like you're multitasking, but it also gives you the empathy, right? Like, cause like seeing at face value, everyone's a, tough motherfucker and like everyone's in that like situation but when you're under the medicine they're crying they're dealing with trauma they're reliving these battles the survivor's guilt like there's so much stuff that you have to process and the medicine brings it out like more than better than any kind of talk therapy i think wow and and how does this uh play into the your paintings you you mentioned a psychedelic painting what 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 Mm -hmm. is what is that so um, 
obviously, well, when you think of psychedelics, most people think like kaleidoscopes and rainbows and unicorns and shit. But um, <laughs> um, the stuff that I'm painting has like there's a lot of symbolism in there and um, things that I've seen during and um, during the peyote ceremonies. Um, they're outside. Um, the ones that I went to were in the Mojave Desert, so very ceremonial with Native American tribe. Um, we're chanting, praying. Um, so just a com uh, culmination of all that. Uh, that's fascinating. Are, for for veterans who might be listening to this and aren't, aren't maybe either getting the help they need through the VA or or having a hard time reaching out, you know, doing a lot of self medicating or whatnot. Sure. Are there organizations that you personally would recommend that maybe they look into? Absolutely. Um, so the Mission Within is one. Uh, Dr. Martin Polanco is who I started working with. He through the Mission Within and the Sacred Warrior Community um, in Austin. Um, really great organization. Hero Cards is a really great organization. Sabo Foundation um, is we're starting up our program so we're ha we're actually hosting our first program in may um and it's uh, not only just uh, psychedelic therapy but it's a wellness retreat we're we're going to be doing meditation sound uh sound baths yoga art therapy with the psychedelic medicine and well. can you say your organization again sure sabo s-a-b-o-t foundation yeah, I hope people go and check that out. Um, I've uh, I definitely, you know, friends of mine have spoken really highly about this stuff over the years and just found it really, you know, it helped when other things weren't, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And usually um, the people that go to these retreats, they're at their, you know, they have nothing else to lose kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So, they, so everyone the, brings it. Like the, So the uh, SaboFoundation.org? S-A-B-O-T foundation.org. I'll put a link, link in that. And, uh, you know, because we know we talk to veterans all the time who mm -hmm. might still be, you know, are either in progress with their post-traumatic stress or, right. you know, haven't, they don't want to reach out to anybody because a lot of times mm -hmm. like trying to find a therapist who even relates to what you've been yeah. to can be, can be very challenging. I think it's harder than dating. <laughs> yeah. For sure, because you're like, I'm, I need to tell someone all my shit, and um, if they don't relate, then it, you're going to feel like you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No, that's fantastic. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions um, or people have sent in. BP, uh, I thought uh, there's one. Uh, uh, David A., thank you very much for the donation. We really appreciate it. Uh, BPA is thank you for the for the very generous donation. He said, "Great topic and guest." We agree. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, Ian Hutchinson, does Sam think her ethnicity helped her build trust with the locals, or did they not care about such things? Um, I think it really helped. I'm Filipino and Persian, so I think um, you know, minus my tattoos. Obviously, you're not going to see him in uniform. Um, and they probably thought I was from there. You know, I, I was Afghani, or at least partial. From that part of the world. Mm -hmm. When when you uh, when you mentioned that like the woman thought oh they're going to take me back and they're going to assault me they're going to do this was there a lot of that sort of a kind of misconception amongst the the locals about what happened to women in? Actually no, um, surprisingly no. Um, there was very rarely like hysterical um, uh, interactions like that. Um, they're usually very calm or cooperative. If they weren't cooperating, they just wouldn't talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, Adam, thank you very much. Uh, really cool and brave to, uh, to take the conversation here, fam. I used to talk about post-traumatic stress. More important mm -hmm. than bang, bang um, stories, uh, bang, bang, beat them stories. Sam is a true uh, heroine and an invaluable asset to the battlefield in our communities. Always out front. I oh, appreciate that. Sam, I also wanted to ask you about your traditional tattoos because, you know, when I, when I saw them and we had a conversation about it a while back, I start making assumptions about, you know, what Pacific Island you might be from, but you surprised me. It's something I really didn't know anything about. Can you tell us a little bit about the, about your tattoos and what they mean to you? Sure. Um, so my tattoos are from the Philippines. Um, I had initially just my quarter sleeves on both arms. My right arm is from primarily for my dad on the upper arm and for my son 
uh, my lower arm, and then my mom, the feminine side is the left side, so my mom's the upper half, and then my daughter is um, the lower part, and then different, this is like a transformative, when I was going, finally going through my healing, and then when my mom passed away, I got one on my upper back. Is, is that, uh, pardon me, because I, I don't know anything about this stuff, is, is that how these traditional tattoos are usually done, that they represent phases in life? Um, you back in the day you would earn them right warriors would earn them during doing certain things um there'd be ceremonies and i don't know if you've seen that but, mm -hmm. but like just traditional way of doing it um but yeah women would get the chest piece and then typically just the outside of the arm um i just wanted to fill it every but typically it's just the outside for women yeah so i so i know in thailand it's sakyan i got i got one of those but what do they call okay. it in the philippines when it's the traditional batok batok uh, yeah, B-A-T, okay. Mm -hmm. did, and then did you did you get all those done that way? So I had found this group called Mark of the Four Waves when I was stationed in Germany. Um, but finding a black work artist or a, a batok artist in Germany at the time was fairly challenging. Um, so he would send me the designs, but I went to like, um, he, would, he specialized in like mandalas and stuff like that, dot work. Um, and that's how I got the majority of my work done. Um, but I do have some on my sternum, the traditional way. Yeah, I, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah and I, I had no idea that uh, it was even done in the Philippines. Um, I, I think of you know New Zealand, Guam, some some sure. other parts of the world. Um, what what part of the Philippines is, is, does this uh, come from? So I'm Visayan, or my parents are from Visayan, but there's a di um, there's different designs or patterns per region. Mm -hmm. So depending on where you're from in the Philippines, you're, the framework's going to be different. The pattern's going to be different. Um, and if you think about the islands in the Pacific Ocean, like back in the day, ancestors would tra uh, travel, you know, and migrate. So you'll see similar patterns. They might mean something slightly different, but um, the patterns were exchanged. So, but. Sam, you, you mentioned the, uh, the psilocybin, the mushrooms. What did you say the conjunctive therapy was with that? Sure. Um, so the retreat that I've done that I've found the most progress, the first day we do the hero dose of psilocybin and the second day we'll do the 5-MeO-DMT or okay. toad. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And mm -hmm. how, how does, because I, I've heard of like microdosing the psilocybin mm -hmm. being an effective therapy. Do you know how, do you know how those two styles of therapy differentiate? Sure. Um, I would say with microdosing, I've used that to get off antidepressants. That really helped me out. Um, when you microdose, you you really shouldn't feel any kind of like head change or buzz or maybe just a little elevated mood. But um, the hero dose, I mean, it just like whoops your ass. <laughs> it just it it's not pleasant. You know, it's not rainbows and butterflies. It's like you're ready to deal with your shit now. Right. Right. Yeah. How, uh, I'm just curious because, you know, you, you hear about, well, I'll, I'll tell you, like I've tried mushrooms once and it was not pleasant for me at all. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, so I would, for me, like, I'd be like, well, that's, that's not for me. Um, yeah. How, how do they keep people from, I don't want to say going to a dark place because that's probably part of the goal, but for, for just not getting sucked into it and for using that as, as processing. Yeah. Um, so when you were doing yours, I, I would imagine you didn't have like soothing spa music, you know, and an eye mask and a, a very safe environment. When people are going through a rough patch in their trip, um, sometimes the therapists will like check in, uh -huh. you know. Um, they like to kind of just leave them and let them process through it. But if it's going too dark, they'll they'll break, you know, like, hey, are you okay kind of thing. Interesting. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Have any of the forms in your research, because I imagine you probably have research, and it has, have any of the different types of modalities proven more effective than others, or are they all because they're all creating separation sort of equally effective? I think um, just from my experience and from my research or, you know, working in this field for a little bit now, like each medicine affects you differently and it's, how open-minded you are, how open your heart is, um, what the experience is like that. Like the ceremony part of it is so vital to the success uh, and integration of the medicine. Um, 
you know, you can, anyone can buy some mushrooms and trip in your living room. It's not the same thing, right? Like to really take it seriously and like as a healing modality, um, I think makes a huge difference. Uh, Will, thank you. And uh, Charlie, he says, as a vet with PTSD who has been a patient in the recent MDMA trials, I can't stress enough how powerful some of these psychedelic assisted therapies are. I believe it will be the default treatment within three years. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there are efforts like there are, I mean, there are people out there who think this psychedelic revolution is happening. I mean, we sort of mm -hmm. went through that movement in the 1960s, not to be too cynical about it. But I mean, do you think we are on, coming up on the cusp of like a wave of legalization and normalization of psychedelics in, in oh, how we absolutely. treat mental health? No, absolutely. Um, the Mission Within and Sacred War Community, like I mentioned, they are now going to be a part of the UT Austin study here. Um, uh, I think it's going to be 30 special operations participants um, going through like brain scanning, treatments, TBIs, monitoring, all that stuff. Um, they stood up a, a psychedelic center at UT Austin. I, you know, I, I really feel like they're seeing the benefits of it. So, at, at UT, what do you think it'll take for for the government? and the VA in particular to finally get on board with all of this? When they figure out how they can monetize. <laughs> uh, That's sad. That's what, I mean, I, mean I, I, don't, true, yeah. I don't doubt you. Yeah. It's just sad. <laughs> uh, Will wanted me to ask, uh, this is a little all over, but who knew she was on a mission? What was garrison life before and after deployment? I think you answered that. Um, did Joe behave downrange? I think we probably answered that. How far did you live from the team? And did she find intel in gross places? <laughs> <laughs> um, I lived like, the only, I think the only questions I, we haven't answered yet. I lived like five tenths away from the rest of the team. Uh, so really close. And then the weirdest place I found intel was in a woman's, they don't have like sanitary pads, you know, so they pulled up uh, rags to use while they're on their rag. Um, so finding stuff there. And you found some hot intel in the rag? <laughs> A phone. Holy oh. shit. Well, you heard it here. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Yeah. Phones in the pleasure garden. Oh, we went um, there. We went yeah, there. not in, but... Um, <laughs> That's what twenty dollars gets you when you ask these questions on uh, on the YouTube's. I mean, I think that's I think that's a valid question though because you've also mentioned issues with like uh, 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 your relative, uh, uh, your niece's wife, I think, but in the infantry. My nephew's or, wife, yes. Did, did or your nephew's wife? Sorry, did did um did Joe behave downrange and and uh, how how did you deal with obvious come on? Sure. <laughs> um, I was fortunate. I was fortunate. They were very professional in that regard. I didn't. You just swat away, you know, compliments or whatever the fuck. Um, but they got the picture really quickly. <laughs> yeah. But um, other TSCs weren't as lucky. What was that? A that was um, like a pretty serious issue you heard with some of your colleagues in the program. Yeah, I mean the elephant in the room, right? You're going to put type A woman with type A men and you're out alone in the middle of the desert. Like it happens with conventional units. So why wouldn't it happen with special operations? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're, uh, we're, do you, do you feel that the military or those units were doing a good deal addressing that or no? No. I don't, I don't think they, they wanted to address it because they, of the pressure of wanting the program to succeed. Right. Yeah. And I so. mean, there's, there's also, you know, two, two things involved here. I mean, in one hand, we're talking about like consenting behavior between adults that, right. Oh, okay. So what, but then when, when it crosses that line, obviously at that point, something really does need to be addressed. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, the consenting adult thing, whatever, but, um, it's still having now things get swept under the rug all mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. 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 It does. Unfortunately. And I, I feel like, you know, 
although it should not, mm-hmm. you can also see the people who want the program to succeed to go, well, if like we acknowledge this as a problem, then, then they're down. just going to yank or shut down the program. So, you know, uh, and again, that's not an excuse. Right. Um, it's at the expense of, you know, a right. woman's mental health, her right. life, her body. Right. Um, but, yeah. Don't really know what the right answer is there. Either. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's complicated. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I mean, it shouldn't be complicated. And, and in in one way, it's not complicated at all. The right thing is the right, right. thing. Right, do the right thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the the military and the entire country knows there's a problem there, and the military still hasn't adequately addressed it. So, I mean, yeah, clearly there's a problem. Um, but we we touched on a couple big topics here. Um. But can you tell us a little bit more about your uh, transition out of the military into civilian life and sort of like where you are today, where you're at, what what you're up sure. to? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned going to art school right mm-hmm. after. Um, and then I got into a program for special art vets. Um, it, don't, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was an advertising program, a year-long program where you do four different rotations at four different marketing agencies. So I moved from, or left Norfolk, Virginia, moved to Boston to do um, a three month internship there, New York for six months, two different agencies there, and then Dallas um, the last three months here. And then I I really enjoyed my time at the agency that I work at now and been here ever since. Uh, And and you said there's a son now too? Yes, yes. So that time uh towards the end of my military career ended up getting married moved to virginia beach norfolk um and the last year of my uh of me being in school i got pregnant and then that relationship didn't work out and so yes co-parenting okay okay yeah 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 and what is, are you still in touch with a lot of the, like the females from the CST? Uh, I mean, I imagine then because it is such a small unit that it, that it is probably closely knit. Yeah. We have um, a Facebook group and like we keep, um, keep in touch via email events. They, they host, we did something for the 20 year anniversary um, last year in New York. Uh, they do stuff at Bragg all the time. So yeah. It's it's really small but tight knit group. That's fantastic. And have you guys talked to like any historians or people like that who are trying to you know capture like the the this small unit? Sure. Um, Gail Lemons, I think is her name, who wrote Ashley's War. Um, I, I think she wrote another book after that. But um, yeah, a few times have people have reached out to kind of share the story and learn about the program. But it's still not a lot of people know about it. Right. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. It, it's a unknown, you know, program. And I mean, I, I guess what, what is the what is the conclusion of you and, and some of the the other women who served in this unit? What were, what are your kind of your big takeaways from the CST program and this overall endeavor in in the special operations community? Um, for myself, I think it what I contributed to the creation of this program or like, you know, what's been established coming from this program, the success of the program, I can say it's something I'm really proud of, you know, uh, whether or not people are all on board or they're not, you know, um, I did my part and I, I feel like I can't, no one can take that away from me, you know? Um, and I think a lot of the CSTs feel the same way. Like, they did what they could do with the resources and given the times. You know, the, the special operations community is very small. I mean, it seems big because of the press it gets, but but it is it is very small. But, you know, the number of women who have been in combat, and I mean the front line of combat, because, like, female truck drivers will, you know, sure. will find themselves in combat. But you're part of even a smaller community of women who have actually sort of been on the front line. Has that, has that done to more to connect you? Has that connected you to vets or, or has it separated you in a way where you're a woman having 
kind of a unique experience. Um, I think, I think it connects more so than not, um, especially with like going through the psilocybin treatments and the retreats. A lot of them are special operation vets. Most majority of them are males. So like hearing, like I have this experience, you know, they kind of relate and they're open to being vulnerable and like letting out their trauma with the understanding, like she's been there, you okay. know? Um, and so, yeah, it's uh it's been a very unique experience in so many ways. I bet. I bet. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that though, because again, it's, it's a topic that we, we try to talk about when, you know, when it comes up and, you know, we know there are still a lot of veterans out there that, you know, haven't reached out and for various reasons, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, a lot of times it's not just a lot of, you know, chest thumping, like I can get the, through this on my own, but it's a rejection of like formal therapy sometimes yeah. and things like that. And, um, and I think it's important for veterans to understand that there are alternatives to just talking to somebody who just graduated from, you know, their PsyD course or whatever and are sitting in a room with them. Yeah, definitely. There's so many different modalities out there. Um, I'm not saying be a guinea pig, but don't be afraid to try. Um, you don't know which medicine was going to work for you or, you know, what will give you the, the most healing. Um, but don't be afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Sam, this has been awesome. Um, really appreciate you taking some time out of your Friday night. I mean, are there any other big things you think like I, uh, that we failed to ask? Anything that you think viewers should know? Um, I think we covered quite a bit. Um, okay. I, I'm really appreciative of talking about the PTSD treatment stuff because the psychedelic therapy, it's the next cannabis. But people are too afraid or, you know, they don't know anyone that's done it. And I think, you know, being an advocate for it and thank you for the opportunity to share my experience about that because more, more veterans need to do it for, for the guys who might, you know, especially for guys who are like the type a and like, I don't need that hippy dippy, like, mm -hmm. you know, new age crap, like, yeah. you know, because you talk about, you know, sound bad, these things, what would you say to those guys who are like, ah, you know, I I've got, I've got my Lafroy, my Jack, you know, and I, I don't need these like new age crappy well, I would say there's a lot of them that show up on the first day and they're, you know, battling alcoholism or cocaine addiction or whatever it is, you know, they're all, they're violent and they don't know why they're violent. Um, but, uh, if you're so tough, don't be afraid to try. Yeah. Because, um, it, it's really beneficial. Sam, where can people go to find you and, uh, and, and see your paintings and see your work? Um, you can check me out on the one Sam com. Uh, same username for Instagram and TikTok. Uh, it's uh, one Sam one or the one Sam one. The one Sam one. Yeah, yeah I, I reached out to Sam on Instagram and I saw some of her pictures on there and I get a little self conscious. I'm like, <laughs> I, I could do that many pull ups, no big deal. <laughs> that used to be my shit. Whatever. I used to. <laughs> Not anymore. Once upon a time. Once upon a time. You still work out though? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. not, yeah, not as crazy as it was. Yeah, I was gonna say. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, and the other thing I just wanted to mention real quick is if you ever um, know any other CSTs or any uh, other women in the special operations community, uh, we'd be very interested in interviewing mm -hmm. them on the show. Um, we're our guests are overwhelmingly male because of the subject matter that we cover. But uh, yeah. we're definitely happy. We're not afraid of the cooties. Like yeah. we, we like to interview women on the show too. Um, so okay. yeah, if you have any friends who uh, who would like to do something like this, um, we're very open to it. Yeah, I'll definitely reach out to some people and see if they're open. Yeah, sure. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's been a great, great conversation. Really nice chatting with you guys. I really appreciate the opportunity. And everyone out there, please uh, like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And check out the down in the description our Patreon page if you want to support the channel and. Uh, and there's like merch down there too. Yeah, yeah. there is. And, and check out Sam's stuff too. Yeah. The one Sam That's it. Cool. Appreciate it guys. All right. Have Thanks a good everybody. night. Bye. -bye. Take care. See ya.